Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. My name is Mikhail Del Rosario, Cultural Engagement Assistant at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And our topic for today is Experiencing the Christmas Story. My guest in studio is Dr. Daryl Bach, Executive Director of Cultural Engagement and Senior Research Professor of New Testament here at Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome, Daryl. Uh, my pleasure, as always. Well, before the broadcast, we were talking about kind of different approaches that we see to Christmas, to the Christmas story. And I've certainly seen this in the apologetics blogosphere and Christian blogs on the internet where you get a couple of different uh, approaches to Christmas. You know, on the one hand, you have people who write about Christmas in terms of how Jesus came to earth. And we look at Jesus' birth in light of what we find out at the end about who Jesus is, like the Gospel of John, for example, starts out telling us. And then the other approach is where we do this defense of the faith, where we're looking at the possibility of miracles, we're looking at um, the historicity of the gospel accounts. What do, we, what do we miss out on by only focusing on these two approaches to the Christmas story? Well, amazingly, we I may miss out on the actual story of the birth. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it, it's surprising because we end up being distracted either by proving the historicity of the account or trying to do that or dealing with the philosophical approach to miracles in relationship to the virgin birth. You know, those of us who have a faith in God being a creator and being present in the creation don't have any problem with him working in that creation. The idea of a virgin birth is not something that catches us too terribly by surprise. But in a modern world, you find yourself defending those things. And in the midst of doing that, you oftentimes miss out on actually the point, some of the key points of the Christmas story itself. Self. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to do with our conversation today in, in this approach is to just walk through the Christmas story. We'll look at it in Luke and we'll look at it in Matthew and see what these different approaches give us and try to put ourselves in the, in the shoes of someone who doesn't know the end of the story. You know, That's right. In fact, one of the interesting things, fascinating things is to think through uh, how the infancy material actually works. It actually lays the groundwork for the two Gospels in which the infancy stories appear. Uh, in Luke, it's setting up much like an overture would in a piece of music, what's going to be happening in Luke Acts. And in Matthew, it sets up the story about how promise has been completed in Matthew. And it does so in a way that that tells us God's doing unusual things. A virgin birth is not a normal activity. <laughs> it doesn't happen every day. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, it, it it signals something special is going on, but watching it dawn on people mm -hmm. what is going on is actually part of the wonder of the Christmas story. Yeah, well, it really is a fascinating story. So let's take a look at the version in Luke to begin with. Luke is writing with uh, primarily through Mary's eyes. And, you know, you think about the Christmas story as the birth of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And yet when you start, the story has John, <laughs> the, you know, the, the story about the, the Annunciation of John's uh, uh, birth. So why is John a part of this story? Well, John's a part of the story because he is the pointer, the forerunner to the Messiah in the Synoptic Gospels. And uh, as a forerunner, it actually is evoking an image that comes out of the Old Testament that says that uh, God's coming will be announced. It will be uh, pointed to. And so John becomes the figure, whether you're thinking about Isaiah 40 or Malachi 3, um, John becomes the figure who points to the arrival of the Promised One, the arrival of the eschaton, if you will. And, and so we go through a full comparison in Luke 1 between the birth of John the Baptist and what John represents, prophet of the Most High God, to what Jesus represents, and that is uh, the son of David on the one hand and the one who is the son of God on the other. Mm -hmm. And so we see John then is pointing toward Jesus. There's kind of a, a parallel um, with, the, with these birth announcements because we move now into uh, the Annunciation to, to Mary. You know, uh, Luke tells us that, that Elizabeth was old. Then we mm -hmm. have this contrast, Mary's very young, mm -hmm. right? How old was Mary, do you think? Mary would have been, uh, if this is a typical first century situation of someone being betrothed, would have been between the uh, ages of 12 and 14. Hmm. So I, I tell people, this is a seventh grader. Oh, wow. you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and your reaction is what the crowd does. I get raised eyebrows, and you re really? And I, yeah, you know, that kind of thing. So we're talking about a very, very young girl. I, I think it's important to understand that in the ancient world, if you lived to be the age of five, the average uh, span of life was 40. Mm 
uh, and it was really exceptional to live to your 60s or 70s. So I, I like to tell my classes, I say, I hate to announce this to you, but you're all senior citizens and I'm geriatric. <laughs> and, and, and so uh, so there's really a sense of, uh, of, of a compressed time of life, uh, and people moved into marriage as quickly as they could. Now, boys, generally speaking, would have been older, between 18 to 25, 30 in that in that range. But generally speaking, the girls would have been younger. So this is a this is a seventh grader. And there's another interesting comparison that is at work here. Um, in the Old Testament, when you get women who are of age who bear children. Uh, you know someone special is coming down the line, Samuel perhaps being the key example uh, in, in relationship to uh, Hannah and, and her giving birth in old age. This is, a, this is a common pattern. But here we've got that a little bit reversed. Here we have a virgin birth in a very, very young child. And there are a lot of parallelisms that are working in this passage where, where you get pairings. Um, you get the announcement to Zechariah, a, a male. You get the announcement to Mary, a female. So there are pairings that are also going through the infancy material that drive the story and that bring balance to the fact that Jesus' is coming is for all people. Hmm. Hmm. Well, this is a very unusual story for sure. Let's take a look at this one verse in Luke, Luke 1, 30 through 32, because the way that this child is conceived is very unusual. The angel says, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Listen, you will become pregnant and will give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. The angel goes on to say he'll reign forever, he'll be holy, he'll even be called the Son of God. What was going through Mary's head when she heard these things of what her baby was going to be called? Well, I, I think that sometimes when we hear Son of God, we automatically leap to Jesus being the second person of the ontological <laughs> trinity. We get a full Trinitarian view. And certainly for people who know the, the entirety of the story of Jesus, that's a natural place to go. But I think at this time, she's really hearing this is the promised one. This is mm. the Messiah. This is the one who's going to bring deliverance to God's people. Uh, and Son of God is an ambiguous phrase in the Old Testament. It can refer uh, – in fact, it most often refers to the king. Uh, mm. I will be to him as a father. He will be to me as a son. That's the language of the Davidic covenant in Second Samuel 7. And so uh, I once heard a devotional from uh, – uh, in a context of a church service around Christmas time from a woman who said, I wonder what what it was like for Mary uh, to raise a child who never made a mistake and who realized she was having a perfect child. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the audience going, I don't think Mary even had that thought. She wasn't quite there yet. And we see this in the context of Jesus' ministry because when he announces uh, the nature of his authority, et cetera, his family comes to him and wants to talk to him about some of the things that he's saying about himself. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what we've got here is an announcement in which the understanding is this is the Messiah, but the people who are receiving this announcement don't yet understand understand everything that the Messiah is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and what they sense is this is God's answer for his promise. God is keeping his word, but there's still a lot to learn about who this figure is going to be. Mm -hmm. So Mary wasn't thinking, this is little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Right? That's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I have no idea whether Jesus whimpered or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we think about Mary being a virgin, how does that tie into Elizabeth getting pregnant? Because there's a kind of a parallel going on here. Yeah, well, again, everything in the parallel is designed to show that anything that John can do, Jesus can do better. <laughs> and so, um, so Jesus is the superior. So the one contrast is probably prophet of the Most High versus Son of God. Another contrast is the means of birth. Mary, uh, Mary has a virgin birth in contrast to Elizabeth who has a natural birth even though she's you know, up in years. So mm -hmm. that there are two miracles, but the one miracle is greater than the other. And, and everything about the way this first chapter is laid out is designed to show John's preparation for the arrival of Jesus. He comes in the spirit of Elijah, Luke says. Uh, this is the pointer role that we're talking about. And, and, and the chapter chapter is even told in such a way that Jesus is the one who emerges from the first chapter as the center of the story. So we get this comparison. We get to the end of chapter one, uh, and we get uh, the hymn 
to uh, to uh, John at at the naming at his naming, mm-hmm. and then immediately John goes off stage, and Jesus is the only subject in chapter two of the infancy narrative. So everything is designed to show the superiority of Jesus in relationship to John, and John doing his role as a pointer, even to the extent of doing flips in the womb, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, 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 of pointing out when the two come together, Mary and Elizabeth for the first time, uh, even from the womb, uh, the text says that. Uh, the child will be filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb, and from the womb he testifies to Jesus when the two mothers come into one another's presence. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Going back to her being, you know, what we would think of as a seventh grader for mm-hmm. Mary, what would that have meant to her culturally to to be found in the state? Well, just think about what's in store for her when she accepts this announcement from the angel, and she says, you know, in effect, may it be to me mm-hmm. as your word. And she actually is presented very much as an example of a of a person of faith who is responsive to God and undertakes uh, the role God has them undertake. So just imagine the series of conversations that she is headed for. She's headed for a conversation with Joseph about her being pregnant. Mm -hmm. She's headed for a conversation with her parents about being pregnant. You know, I wish there was such a thing as recording during that time and that those conversations would have been recorded. Those would have been very interesting conversations to be a part of. Because you can just imagine, I'm I'm pregnant. Well, okay, and how does this happen? <laughs> you know, and um, yeah, I, I tell students when we talked to this, I said, I said the people in this drama are all, all understand biology 101, mm-hmm. and so uh, how does this happen? And then you know, she says, well, it's by the Holy Spirit, and just imagine the burden this puts on the entire conversation uh, when that happens. She's undertaking. That role, and of course, what we see when the announcement is made is she immediately uh, moves off into a hymn of praise, uh, literally littered with the language of the Old Testament, uh, showing her piety. Mary is very much an example of faith, an example disciple in this chapter as she takes on the role of of bearing uh, this child uh, under these circumstances. Mm-hmm. So we take a look at Mary. We take a look at Elizabeth. We see their their faith in this, and Mary says, let it be to me, just like you said, I'm the mm-hmm. Lord's handmaid. And so now we get to Zechariah. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he wasn't the bastion of trust earlier. No, and, he went through a quiet time. That's what I call it. <laughs> you know, when, it, when, he, when this is originally announced him, he asks, how can this be? And, and basically the angel says, well, you're going to be quiet until you see God pull off his word. And, it, mm-hmm. and it's designed to be a lesson to say, if God promised this, uh, if God says this is going to happen, this is going to happen, you're going to watch it happen. Mm-hmm. And you're going to watch it happen. You're not going to be able to speak. You're not going to be able to hear. You can have a little time to reflect on the fact that when God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. The interesting thing about this chapter and this feature of the chapter is, whereas um, Zechariah is put in this large quiet time during the entirety of the pregnancy of uh, Elizabeth with John the Baptist. Mary asks essentially the same question when the virgin birth is announced, and there's no punishment, there's no limitation on what happens to her. I get people asking me, well, why is that? And I said, that's a question for the heavenly press conference. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, but it but it is interesting, this juxtaposition. But literally what's happening, of course, is that everybody is supposed to realize if God says it and if God promises it, it will happen. In fact, this is one of the major themes of these early chapters. Now, why would Luke be interested in saying that? Because there are other things that God has committed himself to through this child who's, who's now going to come to earth and be the Savior and has now been resurrected, there are other things that God has committed himself to that haven't happened yet, mm-hmm. haven't even happened yet for us. So the idea that God keeps his word and he will be faithful and he keeps his promises is designed to reassure us that the things that God has committed himself to will happen. And part of the goal of the Gospel of Luke is to reassure Theophilus of the things that mm-hmm. he's been taught in Luke 1.4. So all these things are driving us to say, we can trust God to keep his word. Mm-hmm. No matter how unusual, no matter how seemingly impossible. That's right. In fact, everything about its 
odd when they go to when they go to name the child, and of course mm-hmm. they pick a name that isn't a family name, it isn't a part of tradition, <laughs> you know. Uh, but it's 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 out of the ordinary, and they're being obedient to the way the angel instructed them to name this child, mm-hmm. you know. And 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 when Elizabeth does it, they go, oh, she's taking advantage of the fact that he can't speak. So then they check it out with him, and then, nope, that's the going to be mm-hmm. be the name. Uh, uh, and and as soon as that happens. You know the this quiet time that uh, Zechariah has been under goes away, and he's able to speak, uh, and we get the hymn that comes off of it. Uh, everything about that is designed to say uh, Zechariah learned his lesson. Mm-hmm. He learned to trust God. He learned to do things the way God does. He learned the fact that the arrival of this Savior is going to call on people sometimes to do things they're not used to doing, to live differently, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, all of that is being reflected in what's going on here. Yeah, and so now Zechariah is being obedient. Exactly and right. And he has this hymn, he prophesies, and I want to read this short section from Luke 1, 68 through 70. Zechariah prophesies, he says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, because he has come to help and has redeemed his people. For he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from long ago. What's the background of this hymn, and what does Luke want us to get at this point in the story? Well, again, it's the arrival of Messiah. It's the arrival of completion of the promise made initially to the nation, the promise that there would be a seed of David who would be a deliverer. That's being appealed to. There's an interesting little juxtaposition to that happens in this passage. It's actually pretty fascinating. You know, it says, it says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. For he has visited us and made redemption for his people. That verb, visit, is an interesting verb because later on in the hymn, it talks about uh, about the mercy of God when the uh, when the 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 rising sun of the morning rises up and visits us. Hmm. Okay, so the Messiah is pictured as a light who shines in the midst of darkness, bringing day out of night. That's the visit of the one who makes redemption and the one who is raised up as a horn of salvation out of the house of David. So the end of the hymn matches the beginning of the hymn and the Davidic promise and the promise of God completing his work through this deliverer is declared very clearly by Zechariah as he announces the arrival of this child. And he says things like um, uh, that, that – He's going to rescue us from our enemies. Uh, he's going to show mercy. He's going to rescue us from the hands of our enemies so that we can serve him in righteousness and holiness all the days of our lives. I like to say that's a great life verse. Hmm. You know, that that's that's the point of the exercise. We're delivered and we're freed, but we're not freed to do our own thing. Mm-hmm. We're freed to live in a way that is honoring to God. Wow, and so the picture that's emerging of John here is somehow he's pointing the way to the Messiah, somehow he's pointing the way to Jesus. And there's elements of salvation and forgiveness here that are at work as well. Um, you mentioned Isaiah 40 earlier. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, it's the idea that uh, it's the clearing of the desert for the arrival of the Lord. It's the passage at the beginning of this last section of Isaiah from 40 to 66, in which the ultimate deliverance of, of not just the people of God in Israel, but of the world is being described. And uh, John the Baptist is being uh, described as uh, as me- issuing a call in which people are to clear the way for the entrance of God. I call it a kind of a creation red carpet. Hmm. You know, everything gets leveled. Uh, doesn't matter whether it's hills or mountains or whatever. And on to this entryway comes the activity of God. That's the picture that we're dealing with here. Hmm. Well, let's turn to the. Uh, core of the Christmas story. When we think about the Christmas story, we normally think of the nativity scene. Mm -hmm. And uh, we go to Luke chapter 2 now. And Luke says there was a census that was ordered by Caesar Augustus, and that's why Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Now, Joseph was of the house of David. Mm -hmm. What what entirely does that mean for him? What's that mean for Jesus? Well, the main thing, what it means for him and what it means for Jesus is this descent of being a child of the Davidic promise is in place. he ends up being in Bethlehem because Bethlehem is uh, in the seat uh, where Judah is and is uh, the tribe out of which uh, this line comes. And, 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 so, and apparently this census was ordered in a way that was honoring to, to the structure of the Jewish nation of Israel where the 12 tribes territories were in play. And, and so that seems to be the reason why Joseph has gone from Nazareth, which is his home, down to uh, down to Bethlehem and down in the southern region. You know, Bethlehem's located really 
next door to Jerusalem. So if he went back and this was his ancestral home, the place was probably packed with relatives, mm-hmm. like when you have relative gatherings, Christmas mm-hmm. parties. Where do you think Jesus was actually born and what would that have looked like? Well, he was born, uh, it looks like he was born in a family stall, basically, in an area where family went. Now you think, well, that's not a great way to treat family. But, but I think what we've got here are people gathered. It, it's a huge crowd. They've all come in for the census, it looks like. And so he ends up in a major, he ends up in an animal trough. Basically, and I tell people now think about this for a second and think about the message this sends. If you were in a public relations meeting and you had the assignment, we're going to plan the arrival of the promised one of all time, mm-hmm. a program that God has been talking about for the ages, for centuries. And, and so you as the public relations firm, what's the best way to announce this arrival and to perform it, to execute it? And you would think about all the pomp and circumstance. You'd put it in a capital city. You'd make a huge fanfare. You'd mm-hmm. do everything. You, I, I think that would be the way we would instinctively think it would happen. Mm-hmm. Instead, what we get is a baby born in an animal trough in a little suburb of Jerusalem, not even the capital city, um, and everything about it. Um, breeze with the most humble status of life into which Jesus is entering. And it's the character of, in, of his entire life to show this kind of quality where he lives really in the midst of everyday life, uh, not, uh, not privilege, but very much, uh, very much in a family context, if you will, that kind of thing, a very humble beginning wrapped in swaddling clothes, put in a manger, an animal trough, and and there um, enters into the world. It's not what the PR firm would design. <laughs> it, it's something far more profound because I think this very humble way in which he enters the world is designed to say, I have come for everyone. I have come to save the world. I've come to save and, and bring salvation into the most common of scenes. And in that way, develop uh, really develop the Christmas story. The mm-hmm. Christmas story is about anyone and everyone. Wow. Yeah, so we have Elizabeth, we have Mary, and now even Jesus in this, this, this very humble state. And it seems like the Christmas story is touching people, like you said, in, in very humble um, state, states, not like you would think would have all this pomp and circumstance for the Messianic story. And certainly the very opposite of the way Roman rulers would handle their power and the way in which they would surround themselves with all these accoutrements of power. What you're getting, rather, is someone who's, who's literally stepping into life at its most basic level and, and, and starting their life from that very place. Mm-hmm. And so what can we tell then if we were stepping into the story not knowing the end, you know, how would the original audience put this together with this juxtaposition of royalty on the one hand and humble circumstances on the other? Well, I think the main thing that you see here is is that they have a sense that this child who's coming because of the virgin birth, et cetera, because of the way in which uh, this ends up being being signed off on, uh, we're we're just short of the story of the shepherds, where the angels announce this to the shepherds and they show up. Uh, everything about this says God is at work, and uh, God is at work in this child who is the hope and the promise. But that what they don't yet realize is how great a uh, bearer of this authority of hope he is. Could you expand a little bit on this hope? Well, I just want you to see how often the idea of David is mentioned in these chapters. I mean, if you go in these two chapters, well, actually the latter part of chapter one, just the beginning of chapter two, but you go back to the announcement of uh, to Mary, it says, uh, it talks about a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. That's one mention. Then it talks about uh, he's being going to be given the throne of his father David, and mm-hmm. it's in 132. Then you come along and and you're listening to what's going on, and, and you come to the hymn of Zechariah, and it says he's raised up for us a horn of salvation in the house of his servant David. And then we come to chapter 2, and we've got Joseph went in from Galilee to the city of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. And so you're hearing David, mm-hmm. David. David, David. I mean, if this were a football game, we'd be spelling it out, you know, D-A-V-I-D. Uh, and, and so this Davidic promise, this Messiah – now, in Judaism, there were a variety of expectations for what this Messiah would be. 
Um, some portraits expected a military deliverer, uh, Psalms of Solomon, and a Jewish text written between the two testaments. Um, uh, looks forward to this political deliverer who's going to be a pal- powerful military figure. That was one portrait. The other portrait was a figure called the Son of Man, kind of this celestial person who had received authority from God out of Daniel 7, who comes and crashes the party of earth from beyond and is this powerful transcendent figure who has judgment authority. That was another way in which the expectation was put forward. And so there were there were a variety of images, but they all shared one fundamental thing. They thought the Messiah would come and defeat the political enemies of the nation. They're mm-hmm. looking for a political deliverance, a physical deliverance, a kingdom deliverance, if you will. And of course, Jesus is going to do something in some ways far more profound than that. He's going to – his battle, as we see in the early chapters of Luke, is not with Rome. His battle is with Satan, so he opens up with temptations. We have the three temptations from Satan. He's uh, performing exorcisms and that kind of thing. So we're showing that this kingdom isn't just about the material political world. It, it is a spiritual kingdom that's designed to work from the hearts. It's designed to be with forces that we can't see, mm-hmm. uh, but that are very real and that uh, that often get in the way between our relationship and God. And so this Davidic deliverer is going to be a little bit different kind of Davidic deliverer than what people were anticipating, which is why in the midst of the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus is sort of slow to say, I am the Messiah. Hmm. Because because they created it had the potential to create expectations that were not in line with the way his ministry would work. They certainly didn't anticipate the idea that the Messiah could suffer. They had a mm-hmm. portrait of the Messiah that was more like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Hmm. You know, I'm going to crush the enemy, um, and and so the idea that this Messiah would suffer is something that they're not prepared for. And the idea that this Messiah was going to be primarily about a spiritual provision that extends beyond any any material, physical kingdom um, transformation, although that's coming later in the, in the return that Jesus is going to perform, the fact that this was happening in stages, none of that was on the table yet. Mm-hmm. And so uh, this is part of what comes along with the rest of the story that the rest of the story has to tell <laughs> mm-hmm. in order for you to understand that that's a part of the rest of the story. Yeah. But this early on in the story, we see all these people in humble circumstances. They're longing for this hope, and yet we have royalty and humility together. That's right. And do you think about the shepherds too? I mean, what kind of um, what kind of status did they have in society? Not much. I mean, right? uh, you know, they 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 would have been your average worker, whether they the, would have the status of a migrant worker or not might be exaggerated. But they were uh, shepherds were were just again another uh, it's another theme of the common people, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and they're. They're there, and the angels make the announcement, and they go to see Jesus, and they share the fact that an angel appeared to them and told them, "Hey, you know, I want to put in a visit to this child because mm-hmm. uh, this is a savior born in the city of you guessed it, David." Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so, in the midst of that, um, you get this sense of c- everything about Luke's infancy material has celebration mm-hmm. around it. You get three hymns. Uh, you get the joy of the shepherds going to see the child. You get the amazement that Mary feels that these things are happening around her. There are a couple of phrases in these chapters where it says, and Mary treasured all these things in her heart. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're very much getting the story through the lens of Mary. and. Everything about it has the note of celebration that God's promise is finally arriving, that he's keeping his word. Mm-hmm. That's that's the that's the chorus that is ringing out as we tell this story from Luke. Mm-hmm. And we have elements of suffering here as well, don't we? That eventually hope. we do, because eventually, of course, we've got the presentation of the child, and we get uh, we get Simeon taking this child in his hands, and he talks about this one's going to be for the rise and fall of many in Israel, and then it goes on to say, he says to Mary, and this is going to be like a sword, you know, mm. piercing you. That's the only hint of suffering in the entire infancy material hmm. is this remark that Simeon makes in his in his in the third hymn of of this material uh, we get one from Mary one from Zechariah and one from Simeon this is the only hint of suffering anywhere it's the only dark note it's the only cloud hmm. in the first two chapters everything else is God's keeping his promise okay yeah joy and celebration exactly and even though Mary is she's willing to endure she knows there's going to be marginalization potentially mm-hmm. embarrassment potentially mm-hmm. she she's looking at 
this joy. That That's right, that's and and the, and it is and it is the context of the joy that they have, and the promise, the the reality of the promise coming to fruition, defines everything that they see in the way they see it. Mm-hmm. So when the shepherds hear that the Messiah is going to be in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, um, that's probably pretty unusual as well. Right? <laughs> yeah, I think that would probably, not probably the way I would have designed no. it. I mean, it very much is a surprise. But it shows, again, it shows God's willingness not just to condescend to come to earth, mm-hmm. okay, but the way in which he does it is important. He doesn't come to earth, you know banging a drum and drawing attention to himself, he comes to earth, coming to earth like almost anyone would come to earth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is such an amazing story. It it's, is. It's so unusual just to, to step back in there because we, we feel like we know it so well. Exactly. You know? But to, to think back to where um, people were, mm-hmm. you know, and then to, to think about how are they putting these things together. There's, there's royalty mm-hmm. and there's humility. Well, let's turn to Matthew now. Okay. Matthew um, gives us the story through, through Joseph's eyes. And I, I kind of feel like this is like a movie. You know, there's one character that's focused in on, and then you restart the whole movie again, and you're looking at it through another character's eyes. Now we get Joseph hearing about this whole pregnancy thing in Matthew. Uh, we look at Matthew 1. Uh, I just want to read a short section here. He's, this is where he's thinking about divorcing Mary, he finds out about the whole pregnancy. Then an angel tells him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And then the angel even says he will save his people from their sins. Now, for us, we certainly um, have a lot of background as to what that's about, because we've read the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. What would Joseph be thinking? What's going through Joseph's head, and how would Jewish readers hear this? Well, imagine the mercy of God that we're seeing here, because earlier you remember, and remember we've kind of jumped out of sequence because we kind of told the story ahead, and now we've come back to Mm -hmm. catch it here. Mm -hmm. But Joseph is in a situation in which he understands that Mary is with child, and he's thinking about what to do with it. Uh, How he found that out would have been another interesting request. According to, <laughs> to know about, and then, and and so he's trying to, in a, as gentle a way as possible, to to put her to the side, um, and now in the mercy of God, an uh, an angel appears in a dream and says, "You don't need to do this. This is this is actually your wife." Um, is pious, you know. This is not something. This doesn't represent an act of immorality or anything like that. This is a special act of God that has taken place here, and so she never actually has to have the discussion with Joseph that we talked about earlier mm-hmm. about how did this happen, uh, because the angel has preempted here. But there's another thing that's going on here that I think is important that we need to mention, and that is. Why do we get two accounts of this? Why do we get two accounts of the infancy story? Why not? Why didn't we just get one running account, which is, of course, what we tend to want to do with it at Christmas? I think about the fireplace scenes that we often have, mm-hmm. where we've got, you know, the baby lying in a manger. There's Joseph and Mary. We get the Magi on one side and the shepherds on the other. And I mm-hmm. go, no, 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 that's not how it happened. Uh, the 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 timing of the shepherds' visit and the timing of the Magi visit is not at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the perspective that Luke is giving us of Mary is not the same perspective of experience that Joseph had that we get in Matthew. And each portrait gives us a slightly different angle and a slightly different appreciation of what's going on. So Luke is very bright and almost airy in the where it tells the story. It's got hymns and celebration. Mm-hmm. Matthew's a very dark version mm-hmm. of the infancy material. Think about what's in the Matthew section. We get we get this this explanation that Joseph needs cuz mm-hmm. seems things seem out of whack. Uh, we get the slaying of the infants, okay, in Bethlehem mm-hmm. because Herod's trying to get to Jesus. You know, the, as bright as the Luke portrait is, Matthew's portrait is dark. And the reason it's dark, at least to a certain degree, is because it shows the injection of the child of God into the history of man forces choices. Hmm. And some people embrace what God is doing, and some people don't want anything to do with what God is doing. And we see those choices laid out at the start. We see some surprising things. We see we see Jewish people who should know better not embracing what God is doing, even though this is in line with their promise. And we see Gentile folk 
who in one sense probably should have no idea what's going on, who are quite aware of what's going mm-hmm. on and are very open to what it is God is doing. And this is in Matthew, the Jewish gospel. Mm. So, um, so there's a very – there's some very interesting moves, and these additional perspectives, I think, show the wisdom of what the canon is. The canon mm-hmm. is this multi-perspectival approach to Jesus in which each angle gives us a glimpse of Jesus that the other story doesn't give us. And so rather than dumping it all into one pot and making what I call gospel stew, mm-hmm. okay, uh, letting each story kind of tell what it's about mm-hmm. is a great way to read the Scripture. Mm-hmm. This is sometimes you, you've taught me a lot about sports and football since <laughs> we've been working together. Yeah. This is like how you have uh, all these camera angles That's right. in, in a football game. And That's it takes right. a long time to make some of these calls because they have so many angles and so many choices. And certain camera angles will tell you what you're looking for and other camera angles mm-hmm. won't. Mm-hmm. And so so, and so rather than trying to make a camera angle do something it's not designed to do, uh, let's allow each camera to, to present the picture that it presents. Mm-hmm. And in this case, we see that two stories are better than one. That's exactly yeah. right. <laughs> now, we often think about Mary's um, potential embarrassment and potential marginalization. What about on Joseph's side? Would he have had kind of a cultural uh, stigma as well? He's in the same situation. You know, the tradition that floated around about Jesus was that he was born out of wedlock. And we know this, this there's, that insult is cast at Jesus in John chapter 7. And so, um, so this is something that Joseph and Mary bore together as they raised this child. I mean, let's face it, a virgin birth is a little bit of an unusual event mm-hmm. out of all the births that we've ever had in the history of humanity. This is, this is a one-off. There's yeah. no other one like it. So, uh, so he would have to bear that as a part of, mm-hmm. of having raised this child. You think about his faith too in his obedience. Exactly he did right. Take Mary well, again, wife. he's shown to be very pious, very sensitive. All the characters – this is actually – we haven't mentioned this is important. All the characters surrounding the birth of Jesus are revealed to be very pious, sensitive figures to God. That's important because you've got someone who is kind of portrayed as a rebel to the Jewish mm-hmm. movement by the theology that has emerged, et cetera. And so, well, maybe you know, maybe he comes from a suspect background. Maybe there's something wrong with the way he was raised, something like that. Mm-hmm. No, these infancy accounts, both of them, both make the point. These Jesus comes out of very pious, faithful Jewish roots. Uh, parents who honor the law, parents who are respectful to one another, etc. Mm-hmm. Well, in Matthew one twenty two, I want to read this verse. It says, "All this happened so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which means God with us." How is Matthew linking this prophecy to Mary's situation? Well, the prophecy, of course, goes back to Isaiah 7.14. This is the one place where that text is associated with this birth in the infancy material, when, no matter which gospel we're talking about. It's part of a series of texts that Matthew cites in the infancy material. This is one of five texts where there's an appeal to the Scripture where the narrator comes in and says, okay, let me tell you about this event and how the Old Testament sees it. Um, and, and And so... Uh, we've got one in relationship to the birth in Bethlehem coming in the beginning part of chapter 2. We've got one, Rachel weeping for her children later. We've got out of, uh, out of I- Egypt, I've called my son. Mm-hmm. That's coming also in chapter 2. We've got he shall be called a Nazarene, which is probably an idea citation as opposed to a specific verse. And so those five all are making the statement. This is in line with, with things that God has talked about. Mm-hmm. This is in fulfillment of what – so it's Matthew saying God keeps his word, mm-hmm. but in a different way than Luke said it. Hmm. Luke said it through the language of the characters within the narrative. They would sing hymns of praise that would evoke the promises of God, talk about the covenant promises being kept. Matthew does it by citing specific scriptures. And the interesting thing is, here's another case where our apologetics sometimes cause us to miss something. Because I love Matthew one twenty three. It says, Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. Well, of course, we get all we don't get past the first part of that line. You know, we end up mm-hmm. talking about the virgin birth and how that goes back to Isaiah seven, et cetera. But the end of the line is pretty important. Mm-hmm. God with us. Yes. I mean, so so that's actually the point of the story. God mm-hmm. is present 
and in our midst in this birth. He is doing stuff that he has committed himself to. Not only does he keep his word, but he's present with mm-hmm, us mm-hmm. in this in this child. And and it isn't just God with us, as the rest of the story makes clear. It's God <laughs> with us, right. you know. And 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 so that. That emerges from from the way in which this story is told, and what's interesting is is that no one actually calls Jesus Emmanuel. Mm-hmm. You know, he's called Jesus, right? Um, but he is God with us, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so this is a pattern that God has. God has a pattern of fulfilling what He promises to do. Exactly right. And so Jesus is a sign child that. Here we go. God is fulfilling his promises no matter how impossible they seem to be. Exactly correct. And 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 again, he's fulfilling things that he's talked about in the Old Testament. It's it's the same message said in two gospels in different ways. Mhm. Mm-hmm. Well, let's move to the Magi now. Okay. You mentioned those little nativity scenes that That's we right. have. We have the Magi, we have the shepherds. And in the traditional nativity scene, they're all there at the same time. Mm-hmm. But that's not the way the story goes, and Matthew gives it to us. In fact, we see uh, that the Magi don't come until later. How much later was that? Don't know. We just know it's later. <laughs> okay. um, uh, but it's not newborn Jesus. No. Well, it's it's not it's it's not at the same point that the shepherds are there. We here's what we know. We know that when Herod went to deal with this after the Magi visited him, they determined he was born in Bethlehem, and, and you know, Herod said to them, you know, tell me where the child is born, because I want to come and, and honor him as well. Um, you know, uh, what we find out is, is the Magi go, but then on the way back, again by a dream, God's direct intervention. Mm-hmm. A lot of dreams in the infancy material in Matthew. Um, uh, they're told not to tell Herod and to go back home. And when Herod figures that out, he goes and he slays all the children in Bethlehem under the age of two. Mm-hmm. Now, probably he's created that window to protect himself in terms of length of birth. But what that tells us is is that there's this this time window into which this event seems to fit. Uh, it might be the case that it's still within that the forty day period that would come in which you have the birth and then you go and you you offer sacrifices for a firstborn at the temple that we see them going to the temple in Luke to do. That's something that they could have gone from Bethlehem to do, go to the temple and then move on in the story. But Bethlehem is also so close to Jerusalem mm-hmm. that they could go to the temple, offer this child, offer the sacrifices for this child, and come back to Bethlehem and then make their subsequent moves later. So we just don't know what the timing is. What we do know is that in all likelihood, those um, fireside scenes that you have <laughs> where the shepherds and the uh, and the Magi are there side by side. It's a nice way to put the whole story together, mm-hmm. but it's probably not how the story happened. And these Magi, they're clearly not Jews. That's correct. Uh, wh- where are they from? They're Gentile what? astrologers, basically, mm-hmm. who've read the signs in the heavens, and they followed the star, and they recognize the star must represent something. And so in, in a way that's – it's interesting – in a way that speaks into a Gentile world. Hmm. God has drawn people out of the Gentile world to see a birth that also relates to them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and so we see this, again, this, this um, consideration that God gives of how to build a bridge to the people that he wants to reach. Mm-hmm. Um, we see it in the way the Magi are drawn to Jesus. That's interesting. And here we see a, another contrast between mm-hmm. people who aren't Jewish who are responding to Jesus in a positive way. And then we have Herod, who is acting as the king and not responding to Jesus. Not to in a mention the way. Jewish leaders that he checks this out with, mm-hmm. okay, and says, all right, um, these Magi say uh, they have a sign in the heaven that, that uh, Messiah is being born, that a figure is being born. Where should that, you know, what should we do with this? And they know the location, they mm-hmm. know where it's, where it's supposed to be happening, but do they care to go there? No. Yeah, yeah. So once again, we see that Jesus coming wasn't just, I just said Jesus coming, but if we think about it from, yeah. you know, in the middle of the story, right. it's so natural for us to do, right? Right. But we see Jesus being born. This birth is so unusual that it doesn't impact just Israel. It impacts the nations That's as well. exactly right. And this division, uh, uh, this this tendency of many of Israel not to appreciate what's going on and the openness of the Gentile world is hinted at even in the infancy material of Matthew, the Jewish gospel. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Well, wow, we've covered a whole lot of material 
But as we move into the Christmas season, what can we take away from, from Luke and from Matthew um, as, as we move into the Christmas season and, and think about this from kind of inside the story? Well, I think the main thing to take away from it is to show uh, the one, that God keeps His Word, that He keeps His promises, that promises made long ago are being realized, and the promises that remain, that still to be kept, still remain to be kept, are going to be kept, that, that, that we can trust God to complete what He started. I think that's one very important feature. Obviously, the centrality of Jesus as the Messiah, as the one who is the promised one, as the one who brings the promise and commitments of God is a very, very important uh, element in the equation and is central to the story, uh, even though in none of the passages that we have discussed, Jesus does any speaking. All the talking is about him. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then we have the whole, the whole humility with which this is mm -hmm. done, that it walks into everyday life, it's everyday people, it's not done with fanfare. It's not done in a capital city. It's done uh, in, the, in the dirt of everyday life, yeah. if I can say it that way. And in the midst of that, God is making a statement that he's reaching out to touch everyday people in an everyday way so that every day for them can count. Amen. Amen. Well, we thank you so much for joining us here on the Table Podcast today uh, to talk about Christmas, looking at it not from the end to the beginning, but from the beginning and wrestling with humility and royalty and how Jesus didn't just show up and be born for Israel, but for the nations too. And this really is hope for all the nations. Indeed. And we hope everyone has a great Christmas. Amen. Merry Christmas. We'll see you next time on The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.